All right. Thank you all for having me. Hello, fellow kids. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm for once the underdressed child in the room, so that's, that's it's not actually that new. Um, so I'm, uh, my name is Palmer Lucky. I give away money and I also give away jobs. Uh, but it, what I like to do every day is work on autonomous systems for DOD, uh, primarily Marine Corps and Department of Homeland Security. Um, I'm here today to talk about it for, for, for a few reasons. First of all, I'm a huge fan of the hacking for defense approach. And really, this is not enough. We really need something like 100 times more people doing exactly this type of thing. Because this concept of connecting really smart people who want to work on these problems with the problems is, I think, the right way to do this. And I'm especially a fan of the way that you guys are you know, hearing these problems from your potential customers, but not necessarily taking what they're what their proposed solutions are as, uh, as the gold standard. You know, the, the thing that I've learned working in the defense base, no offense to the people wearing uniforms, you guys are really good at knowing what your problems are and they're very good at communicating what the problems are, but they're not always the best at coming up with the optimal solution and that's just because you, know, you, get, more people working on, on a, you get more people working on a problem, you're gonna have a lot better solutions. Uh, so a little bit of background. Uh, I started Oculus when I was living on my own in a camper trailer. Uh, and I, I stayed there for a few years. We, we sold the company to Facebook for $3 billion and I made a lot of money that way. Uh, and then Facebook fired me after I'd grown it to about 1,400 people and I decided I wanted to work in the national security space. Uh, that wasn't actually a new decision that I'd made. It's something that I'd knew, known that I'd wanted to do for years. Uh, prior to starting Oculus, I worked in an army funded research lab on a virtual reality exposure therapy program for soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. The idea being that you could expose these soldiers to the types of environments that they had problems coping with and that they could learn to cope with them and they could learn uh, coping strategies so that they didn't have to be so dependent on, on drugs and uh, just having a bad time. And while I was there, I realized that a lot of the technology we were using was really bad. I realized that the process for obtaining new technology was really bad. And the whole time that I was at Oculus, I couldn't stop thinking about that. And I, I tried to help with a few groups. I tried to work with, uh, with some interesting branches in the government that were doing some cool simulation stuff. And the process was just really, really bad. Uh, so when I decided that I wanted to work in the national security space, the approach that I decided that I wanted to take was a product focused approach. So rather than going to our customers with a white paper or a sketch and saying, hey, here's an idea, here's this rough concept we have, we want the taxpayer to pay for all of the research and development. Uh, I wanted to make an approach where we're using our own money to decide what to build, how to build it, when it's done, and then selling it to the customer as an actual product. The problem with that approach, and the reason that it's not a scalable model for innovation for the entire Department of Defense, is that it relies on me having a ton of money. And this is not a unique problem. If you look at the private sector, there are only two defense companies, I'm not trying to discourage you guys, by the way, if it sounds like I'm being a little downbeat, just, I'm just being real with you. There are only two unicorns in the entire venture, back, like venture, venture backed communi company community that have become unicorns working with the DOD, and that's SpaceX and Palantir. And as much as I love SpaceX and I love their mission, you have to admit that their mission is not defense. You know, their defense work is incidental to their mission of getting to Mars. Now, what do SpaceX and Palantir both have in common? The only two unicorns in the defense product space. Can anybody, can anybody throw it out there? Yes. They both sued their primary customer. <laughs> that is a really good one. So that is one thing that they have in common. Uh, they, they both, both of them had to sue their customers and try to get the government to actually abide by the guidelines that the government themselves set. Yes, we had another guess right here. Both PayPal founders. Both PayPal founders, but even more relevant, they both had billionaire co-founders. So it turns out, like, you know, what, what, what's the old joke that you can apply to anything? What's the best way to become a millionaire defense contractor? Start as a billionaire. That's right, you start as a billionaire. And so, the, I, so, so, so this is an approach that you can take when you have an enormous amount of capital. And I did this because I felt like I didn't have a choice. I mean, I, I, had, I was friends with a lot of the other people who had been made very wealthy by Facebook. And some of them uh, got into collecting air-cooled Porsches, and some of them are just cruising around the Mediterranean. And I felt like I had a duty to work on these types of problems because I'm very afraid of what other nations are doing relative to us. I'm very worried that we're falling behind. And I'm worried that there's a lot of talent that's going underutilized working on problems that don't matter, like search engine optimization and advertising optimization and advertising optimization. I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, I had to work on something that was important. I think that... 
But one thing that I think all of us in this room have in common is, you know, we might differ on the details of exactly what's driving us, but I think all of us have that sense. All of us want to work on something that's really important. We want to work on problems that we're not going to be able to touch if we're working at Snapchat or Facebook or these days, Google. Um, and I'm really happy to see, I'm really happy to be here. I can't wait to see what you guys are presenting today. I already know some of the things I've had with some of you before, but I'm going to see other stuff. Uh, you told me that we could have a couple questions. Sure. Is that still true? Do yeah, we still have time? Still true. You're on time. All right, we're going to do two to three questions depending on how fast we can talk at each other. Does anyone want to go first? Question? Looking around the room. Come on, one question. I'm going to look really dumb if nobody asks a question. <laughs> Boom. What advice do you give to us younger students? How do we become as rich as you? I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, I started working on virtual reality because I was fascinated by it. There had never been a successful VR company at that point. I didn't get into it to become wealthy. Um, I know that is cliche and sounds trite, but it's true. I got into it because I was passionate about it and I became extraordinarily lucky to work on the right technology at the right time. I, I'd say the best advice that I can give you if you want to become wealthy is get really good at understanding what your weaknesses are and then find other people that cover those weaknesses and trust those people as much as you can. Because if you try to do everything, it, 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 the whole myth of like the god boy king CEO of a tech, Silicon Valley tech companies is totally a myth. I've seen these people, I've met these people, I've worked with them. They all rely heavily on the people around them. They are usually very good at one specific set of things and they, they act like they're really good at everything and like they're the reason for every face of facet of success in the business. That's not what you're going to be able to do. You have to find other people and you have to trust them to do their jobs. Uh, so that, that would be my number one piece of advice. Dude, I'm only 26. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> all right, next one. Um, well, I like to think that my company is going to be one of them, but you know that's that. It, it seems to be a pretty good pattern of billionaires starting defense companies and then being able to bend the system to their will and then it turning out really well. Um, it's it, it's less obvious for companies that don't have those resources. Who are the next ones going to be? I think that they're probably going to be companies that have been focusing on enterprise stuff and they're going to pivot into DoD stuff. And I know that's the opposite of what you usually see. Like we've, we've had vendors are, that we work with ourselves who started doing work with DoD. DoD gave them SBIR grants, they gave them little bits of money here and there. And then as soon as their dual use product ended up becoming successful in the enterprise space, they completely abandoned DoD. I think that we're gonna see other companies that are pivoting the other direction because DoD is understanding that they're not going to be successful unless they invest beyond these really small SBIRs and these tiny little research contracts that basically lead to like innovation theater where it's like I'm gonna do this research project that looks really good and it films really well and it goes up on a poster board really well. Sound familiar guys? But they're but not investing enough where it's actually making its way to productization. And I'm speaking in broad strokes. If anyone says what about X? Yes, X is great. But you know the, the everything is not X. Alright, one more question. All as, as far back as we can go. Here, here we go. You can change one Oh man, one thing. <laughs> All right. So I, I I could get into the nitty gritty and suggest some small some like like this procurement vehicle should work better or people should use OTAs for what they're actually supposed to be used for instead of not using them. But I think the best thing that, that could be done broadly, if I could just snap my fingers and it happened. Um, hang on, I totally forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I think that. Broadly speaking, the DOD needs to generate success stories that cause venture capitalists and people who give money to private companies to want to give money to private defense companies. Right now, we're in a situation where the only way to raise money from the VC community is to say, I have dual use technology. We're doing all this DOD work, but really, it's this big platform play. We're going to make all these money off these commercial sectors. And the reason for that is that venture capitalists, at their core, whether they admit it or not, are pattern matchers. They don't actually want to invest in things that are completely different. They don't want a weird founder and a weird business and a weird model and a weird product. They want, they want everything to be normal and then there's one weird twist. Uh, it, it, it's, it's true. They don't want to invest in things that are too different. And as pattern matchers, venture capitalists are sane people and they say, you know what? I'm looking at the landscape. You know how many unicorn defense companies there are? Oh, that's right. There's none except for those ones that were funded by those ideologue billionaires that wouldn't even take my money. Uh, I think that if I could change one thing about the DoD procurement process, it would be to do a variety of things that would generate at least a few success stories so that venture capitalists would feel like they have 
Venture capitalists need to feel like they can take money from their clients and put it in defense companies and not get shredded apart by the partners in their firm. Right now, if I'm a venture capital partner and I put a ton of money into a defense company, all my investors are gonna come and they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna be pounding on me saying, why do you do that? That's so dumb, it's totally gonna fail. And the statistics show that they're probably right. So um, I, I know that that's, that, that's, a, that's a broad thing, but that, that's what I would say. Thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to talk. I look forward to staying in touch. I think that we all want to do the same things here. All right.